Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the YPod, where we highlight everyday Wyoming leaders. Very excited for you to hear not only a voice you'll recognize and a name you'll recognize, but now a face you're going to recognize. Don Day, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Eric. Absolutely thrilled to chat a little bit with you because I think a lot of us in Wyoming have heard your voice, but may not know many of the stories that go behind that voice. Uh, as a place to start, and then we're going to go some unexpected places for some folks, but as a place to start, could you tell us a little bit about your background, where you came from? I know you went to the university here, but could you give us just a quick background? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm somebody that's always been fascinated by the weather since I was little. And, you know, two things I always wanted to do was weather, and I loved aviation, always wanted to be a pilot, but the weather was my first love. And so when I um, got started, uh, I started young and had that, that yearning to learn more and as much weather as I possibly could. I remember uh, staying up at night and also getting up early in the morning to listen to weather reports on the radio. For those of folks who, the uh, older folks out there listening, remember the weather radios, which they still have now. You know, I'd go to bed listening to a weather radio when it would just just do the weather over and over again. I just loved it. So I always had that fascination for it. So when I um, got out of high school, I actually went to high school in Michigan. I uh, lived in the Detroit area for a while, but my family had roots in Wyoming. And so I would spend every summer, almost every summer of my childhood at our family cabin west of Laramie and uh, just fell in love with Wyoming. And then I also fell in love with the weather in Wyoming because you can't really find a place like Wyoming when it comes to the weather, the variety, the intensity, the wild swings we get. It's just a fantastic place to be a meteorologist because you get to experience so much. Now that makes it difficult, but it also makes you better in the long run. And when you mention this idea of the variety, when we go from using our air conditioning one way to turning on our heater the next day, do you actually find that entertaining or interesting? I get accused all the time. Um, when people hear on here, when they listen to me on the radio, they can tell when I'm excited. They can tell that the weather's about ready to go really nasty because I'm excited and happy. And I totally admit that. I, the worse the weather, the more happy I am in terms of being able to watch it and experience it. You know, everybody likes sunny days. Everybody wants a sunny day to go to the park, get around to golf and go fishing, you know, do the things you want to do. And I enjoy those days as well. But after about a week of sunny days, I'm ready for something different. I always tell people, if I don't have bad weather, it's like being a doctor with no sick people. You got to have something to do. So whenever we get adverse weather conditions, we should all be happy for you because at least you're excited about it. That's right. If I'm excited and happy, watch out. <laughs> Absolutely true. Now, coming out of uh, university, one of the things we talked about was the way that most people in the public think of meteorologists is they think of someone who does the weather on the news, but you ended up following a very different path in terms of your career. How did you get started in your career? Well, I had to get really creative. Um, when I graduated from the University of Wyoming in the early 90s, I actually had a job all lined up. I was going to go work for the National Weather Service. And if you're a meteorologist, um, especially in the uh, early 90s, your options were uh, go into the military, where they obviously need a lot of weather support, uh, become a TV weather presenter. Um, a lot of people were really interested in doing that then. Uh, or you usually work for a government agency, and you know the big one is the National Weather Service. So I was all ready to go, but there was something in the early 90s that happened, a uh, big budget crisis, and they did what was called the Graham-Rudman Act, and they put me on a hiring freeze. So I was hired, but I wasn't hired, and I was told it was going to be 12 to 24 months before my job that I had uh, would become available. And so I remember asking the head of the weather service uh, in Cheyenne. I said, well, what do I do? And he goes, well, you know, deliver pizzas, you know, do whatever it takes, you know, this, your job will be there, you just gotta wait. And so um, I didn't have two nickels to rub together. Uh, I was just out of college. I was used to living on a few hundred dollars a month. And I said, you know what, I'll just uh, do some things. And when I was at the University of Wyoming, uh, my part-time job, one of my many part-time jobs was working at uh, Wyoming Public Radio, 
uh, it, then it was known as KUWR, still is, but uh, it, it was a, an experience to where I got to be behind the microphone. I was doing news, I was doing sports. Uh, I remember finally, well, maybe not so finally, but I had a, a shift that went from 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. on weeknights to where I would play new age music for seven hours. Um, <laughs> it's like, wow. But I loved, I loved broadcasting. And so what I decided to do was, you know what? I've got a year or two years. And I started calling radio stations in Wyoming and Colorado. And I said, hey, how would you like your own weatherman? Um, and they would say, well, sure. I don't know you from Adam, but you know, um, you know, what's your pitch? And my pitch was, I'll give you the weather forecast that you can play on your radio station and you give me a certain number of minutes every day and I'm going to go try to find my own advertisers. You get the program for free. And so I had 14 stations say yes. And so um, I built on that. I uh, ended up getting a um, small business loan uh, to get it started. I ended up in what was called the Laramie County Enterprise Center, which is a incubator for startups. And I just started a business knowing that I was probably going to have this full-time job come up whenever. Um, and when that job did come up, it did come up. The, the hiring freeze went away and I had started my own business, was really enjoying it. I was still destitute. I, you know, I could barely pay my bills, but I got an $8,000 loan and I was able to make that $8,000 loan. I lived on that for about a year. <laughs> And I decided to pass up the government job. I decided that I really liked what I was doing. And so I basically created my own job through, through this concept of what's called private meteorology, which is be able to be a weather forecaster, but find niches. You know, my niche when I started was broadcasting and taking that experience that I had at the University of Wyoming and applying my meteorological knowledge and trying to reach an audience that in this part of the country really needs good weather information um, that is especially tailored to agriculture. So when I started, I, I was really tailoring to the farmers, the ranchers, and then the folks that travel. I mean, I always tell people at any one time in the state of Alaska, um, half the population's in the air, uh, they're flying. You know, they fly like we drive, but in Wyoming, uh, you look at how many people, how many miles people will drive to a coal mine or to an oil field. You know, it, they're in their car driving a long distance to work, and so they, they need the weather. So I found that niche, and the radio was a great vehicle, uh, still is, to be able to communicate that information. And the idea of the unexpected comes up in this uh, this is one of the places I said we may go in an unexpected direction at the beginning. <laughs> so there is a hot air balloon in here, but the story doesn't start with the hot air balloon, does it? No, it doesn't. You know, in fact, uh, I ended up getting involved in the what's called the lighter than air LTA a aviation thing because of a, of a black lab. Um, had a new black Labrador named Murphy who... Uh, needed a walk. Anybody that's owned a Labrador Retriever knows that they need five or seven, six walks a day. And uh, this dog was no exception. And my wife and I took the dog up to a park, which is about eight blocks from our house. And somebody was up there with a hot air balloon, start talking to him. And the next thing you know, we find out that they have a balloon club and they're always looking for people to come out and help. And they found out I was a meteorologist. And so they said, well, boy, balloons and weather, we need good weather. One thing led to another, and within three years, both my wife and I became hot air balloon pilots. And what that did was that opened up a whole new world uh, for me, not only in just the sport of hot air ballooning, but it opened the door to all these other things that I, I didn't even know existed uh, in terms of balloons and what happens with balloons from scientific and military purposes. Uh, it, it opened up a whole new world to me. What is it that you like about ballooning, lighter than air, transport? What is it you find enjoyable about it personally? Well, personally, it, it's, it's a fun way to fly. It's a totally different sensation. You know, you, when you get in an airplane, 
or a helicopter, you're, you're forcing the environment, you're forcing the atmosphere to make you fly. When you fly in a balloon, all of a sudden you become the weather. And so with, with my meteorology background, I love ballooning, still do, because all of a sudden you're, you're, you're the weather, you're in these different layers of speed, you're in these different directions you're going, you're at the mercy of the weather. And so it, it helped me as a weather forecaster immensely to understand these little air currents and these little subtleties that happen not only as you go up higher in the atmosphere, but I learned very quickly that the terrain, where we live, the river valleys, the mountains, the canyons, the arroyos, the prairies, all of those things shape the weather. And you don't really get an appreciation for how much the terrain you live in affects the weather until you get in a balloon, because you find out that the wind and the weather patterns tend to work in concert with the terrain, not the other way around. But the, and so that gave me a heightened sensitivity and actually really enhanced my meteorology knowledge by just being exposed to that. And the difference you mentioned between hot air ballooning and flying in a plane, as an example, many of us can relate to flying in a plane. We think of going from point A to point B as a straight line or a curved line with the surface of the earth, but it's, it's very clearly from point A to point B. I imagine it's not like that when you're in a hot air balloon. <laughs> no, no, it's not the most pr practical form of transportation, that's for sure. You can't get in your balloon and say, hey, I, I think I'm gonna fly to Casper today. No, what you do is you take off and you have a basic idea of where you think you're gonna go, but you never know where you're going to land exactly, most of the time. And so you learn you know, it's, it's almost a philosophical thing is, is that when you fly a balloon, you have to give up some amount of control. You have to be able to work with mother nature, so to speak, to be able to do what you want. And so it gives you a different appreciation. And, and then also, you know, the history of ballooning, it was really the first form of aviation. Long before the Wright brothers, uh, the balloon was invented, a hot air balloon, the, the best known one, was in the late 1700s by a couple of French brothers uh, who flew balloons out of Paris um, using uh, basically leftover wallpaper scraps to put balloons together. And so it's the oldest form of aviation. And so there's, there is something about that allure as well. So you, this is extremely simple. You got a bag with hot air in it. It can't get any more simple than that. But to fly one of these and to land one of these and try to exert as much control as you can with what the weather gives you really does heighten your senses. And it, it does give you a, a really good appreciation for aviation in general, but especially the pioneers who uh, really had the guts to go up there. Uh, I mean, when ballooning started, they didn't even know if, if a human could go above the ground and even survive since no one really had done it before. Ballooning also has given you a different perspective, you had mentioned, because you started now to think about different layers of the atmosphere. And, and when we first spoke, you said something I, that really struck me, that when most of us standing on the ground think about the atmosphere, we don't think about it the same way that you do. No, not at all. In fact, you know, we, we, when we look up, we see the blue sky, we see the clouds, and we know at night that that all goes away and we see the stars. But what I was, have been able to learn is that it's like a, a layered cake, uh, the atmosphere that we live in and rely on to, to survive. And so there is structure. So when you look up and you see blue sky, it's all invisible. But there are these different layers of temperature, different layers of humidity and air densities that make the atmosphere what it is. Um, as this diagram shows you, you know, we live in the troposphere. Everything that we exist, you know, even the tallest mountains, it's all in the troposphere. Um, but then as you go up higher, a lot of people say, well, when you go up higher, you're just going to space, which is true. However, um, when the Apollo and the Mercury program started, you know, the rockets would go through the troposphere, they would go through the higher layers of the atmosphere and people really wouldn't pay any attention to it. However, as you study the atmospheric structure of the earth, you find out that there's these layers that you can do things in that you didn't maybe think of uh, before. And again, going back to balloons. 
some of the pivotal research in not only meteorology and understanding how our atmosphere works, but in the whole space race, the whole understanding of how do we get to space and what can we do uh, really resides in the stratosphere because way back in the 1930s and 1940s, they would take these balloons filled with hydrogen or helium and send them as high as they could go. The, the idea was, let's see how high we can go before you know, we, we need a spacesuit or that type of thing. And a lot of that happened really way back in the 30s and 40s. And then as the aircraft evolved, uh, especially after World War II, they started to say, you know what? We got this thing called the Cold War. And we really need to invent some airplanes that can fly so high, well, the Russians aren't gonna be able to see the airplane. And so they said, well, you know, there's this thing called the stratosphere, we don't know much about it. So they did a lot of research. They sent balloons up with people into the stratosphere in the 50s. And the next thing you know, they developed some of the spy planes, which, you know, for you history lovers, you know, you can go back uh, and go back and see where some spy planes were shot down or, or crashed, that uh, the secret was out, that they developed aircraft that went in the stratosphere. To be able to understand how to have an aircraft work, let alone be able to have a parachute attempt out of the stratosphere if the plane is going down, well, that involved a lot of balloon research. Um, and because you can take a balloon and you can float it to the stratosphere, to some extremely high altitudes, and you can put equipment on there to measure all of these scientific parameters, uh, and you can easily communicate with a balloon when it's that high up with a radio signal, since there's nothing getting in your way of the signal when it goes straight up. When you begin to look at different projects, and what folks will see on their screen right now is a project that you've been involved in in Cheyenne with high school students, when you think about the difference between taking a manned balloon up and the idea of a research balloon up, is it just a difference in scale or is it a completely different thing? No, it's really just a difference in scale. Um, from, the, from this picture here, what you see is you see the balloon on top and you see a little patch of red and blue there. That's actually a parachute. And then the box you see at the bottom is, is the payload. So if, if you were to do a scientific flight, it would look just like this, but the scale would be much different. In these situations, I, you know, I call these hobby balloon launches to where the FAA allows you to fly a balloon into the stratosphere with something as long as it's less than five pounds. So we have to put all of our experience, make it five pounds or less, and uh, we string it up on this balloon. The, when the, the balloon actually goes to the highest level it can get to and then it pops, then your payload comes down under a parachute. The same thing happens um, on research. You know, it, it's, when, I, when I work with the, with the kids with, the, with this program is, is to say, this is basically just like going to space. You have to get something up and you've got to get it back. And I always tell them, I said, this is the best type of project because it involves so many different sciences. It involves engineering. It involves logistics. Because when you let the balloon go, you got to know where it's going to go. You got to know how it's going to go. And then you got to go find your payload. So there's a lot of things involved with this. It looks simple. And that picture is very simple. Balloon, a parachute, and a box. But it's much more complex than that one layer of complication, you mentioned the FAA. Why is the FAA involved with these balloons? Because before you and I talked, that didn't even occur to me. That's right. You know, you think, you know, you go to a birthday party and, you know, there's kids with the balloons, they let them go, it floats away and you just never see it again. Well, since these balloons do go so high, they transit the air corridors that commercial aircraft go through. So as you're going to the stratosphere, you're going through 15, you know, that's your general aviation altitudes, you know, 10 to 15,000 feet or so or lower than that. And then you're going through 30, 35, 38, 40,000 feet. So the next time you're on a commercial flight, the captain says, you know, we'll be heading eastbound and we'll be reaching 38,000 feet. Well, the FAA wants to know if you're going to be sending something up there because that's why it's a five pound limit on, on, these, on these projects like this because uh, it's light enough that if a 747 sucks one of these into its engine or hits its wing, it's not gonna cause the plane to crash. 
So there is coordination. You have to actually call the FAA and say, I'm launching here. This is where the, we're, our direction, and this is the altitude that we're going at. So they put that in what's called a, a pilot report, uh, what's called a NOTAM, notice to airmen. And let's say we launch the balloon from Cheyenne at eight o'clock in the morning, and we'll be up in the air till 10 o'clock. A pilot can look that up and say, oh, there's gonna be a balloon in this area at that time. So it, it, another thing is when you look up and you see that atmosphere, a lot of times you see contrails. Uh, if you, uh, there's several uh, things on the internet where you can see where aircraft are at any given time in the world. And it, you will be shocked when you see how many aircraft are in the air at any one time. So the, the airspace is a lot more busy than you think. It's one of the many things that you had to learn about this area, this, this idea of stratospheric travel, stratospheric transport. And I think you mentioned to me, there are not very many people who have this expertise. It's, a, it's not a common knowledge set. Do I remember that right? Yeah, no, that is correct. I mean, the, the, uh, the history of scientific stratospheric ballooning has basically been either at the university or the governmental level. Um, and when you try to take something to the stratosphere, it's expensive. Um, it's much more expensive than it used to be. You know, the price of helium is really, really high right now. But these would be large operations because the balloons, if you're going to take up a, let's say, you know, a lot of work with telescopes uh, was used, you're taking up a thousand pound telescope, well, you need a huge balloon. So you have to be able to uh, forecast the weather to where the weather is going to be good to launch a very, very large balloon that's very sensitive to the wind. You got to know which direction it's going to go and you got to be able to get your payload back without landing a thousand pound payload on someone's house. So uh, the number of, of meteorologists, you know, you can count on one hand, you know, they usually were a government or me a military meteorologist uh, because it's a, it's a niche. Again, this is one of these, these things that you find out when you, when you get in any business is you tend to find out that you get a little certain level of expertise in certain areas. And so that's what I've been able to do is get this expertise in, in, in stratospheric weather because there's a lot of weather up in the stratosphere and there's a lot of weather from the ground to get up there that you've got to be able to figure out because of the logistics involved in something that is big and heavy. Because of this specialized knowledge, You've gotten to be involved in some projects even I had heard of, and I'm not a fan of the stratosphere on a day-to-day -day basis. <laughs> not uh, many people. <laughs> this project, I think many people have either seen or heard something about. Could you tell us, for those people who might not have seen it, what is this and how were you involved in this project? This was a project called Red Bull Stratos. Uh, so for those of you familiar with the, the energy drink, that is the Red Bull. And this, uh, this uh, picture that you see right here, this happened in October 2012. Um, the goal of the project was to uh, have Red Bull sponsor something that not only was going to be something fun to watch, an event, so to speak. So this, this is what you'd call event marketing. Uh, they wanted to create an event that would get global recognition and at the same time attract or be attractive to their highest, uh, the demographic that buys their most energy drinks, which is the younger demographic who likes extreme sports. And so what they did was is they uh, went back and uh, had a group of skydivers. Red Bull actually employs athletes. You can actually be around the world a Red Bull athlete, uh, whether you're a cyclist, a snowboarder, a skier. They also had a group of skydivers, and the person that's in the suit here is a guy named Felix Baumgartner, who was a parachutist for Red Bull, who approached Red Bull and said, I want to break Colonel Joe Kittinger's record of 100,000 feet diving from the stratosphere. It took a lot of convincing, but they said, you know what? Let's do this. And so this essentially became like a space program. We technically didn't go to space, but we had to send somebody almost to space and get them back safely and alive. And uh, I ended up in the course of my ballooning experience, 
uh, was hired on as a consultant to do a lot of Air Force research lab balloon flights that were taking up military payloads or scientific payloads that involved launching balloons that were in the neighborhood of four, five, six hundred feet tall. Um, so I ended up with a skill set that that not a lot of people have, and they they tracked me down and said, "Hey, do you want to be part of this project?" And uh, of course, I I had it. I really had to jump at this opportunity to do this. It was a very difficult, very stressful project, uh, but it was an amazing. You know, it's one of these things that you you do in your life that has an impact on you for the rest of your life. And this was certainly one of them. Of all the different challenges you, you had to figure out on this, if you had to pick one that still stands out to you as something that, that you know you had to struggle with and you're proud of really figuring it out, does anything pop to mind? Well, yeah, I mean, several things. A lot of it's in layers. I mean, the, the responsibility that I had, and most meteorologists would in these situations is, is picking the right day where the wind conditions are good, um, picking a situation that's gonna have the highest level of safety for both not only Felix Baumgartner here, but for the ground crew, the recovery crew, and we talked about the FAA, making sure that we didn't interfere with any air, airspace traffic. And then the biggest thing, which um, caused me, I think, to get a, a few gray hairs earlier than I wanted to was Oh, by the way, Don, this is going to be a live broadcast TV event with only a 10 second delay, um, which means you got you have to put it everything together. And the thing is, is I had the responsibility of what's called go no go, which is do we go today? Do we make all the decision to put all of these uh, resources, spending a lot of money basically, um, and putting this together and. For those of you who followed this project, um, we were tremendously successful, uh, uh, over the top successful in what we were able to accomplish. However, there were failures along the way. And this balloon launch that took Felix to the 128,000 feet, we actually had to an abort a launch. Uh, we actually were live on television and had to scrub the whole thing. So um, what, what I, I guess what I'm most proud about is the fact that uh, we were able to get all of the things to line up. And at, at that point in my, my stratospheric career, I was still really learning. And I, I had to make some mistakes. When I say I had to make mistakes, the mistakes that I made helped me make the right decisions as this program went along. So I always remind people, I say, if you're on a big complex project, you stumble, you have failures that in hindsight, you're gonna find out that those failures actually led to your success. Um, and this was one of those situations where I really took a lot, I really took a lot from that and saying, you know what? If we hadn't had this happen, this wouldn't have ended up this good. Um, so, but, but it, was, it was interesting. When we were all done with it, we actually, we had several post meetings um, uh, and we had somebody from NASA come and said, what you guys did would have cost us five times more um, and taken five times longer. Um, and the big joke at that time was, oh, an energy drink can send a guy to space, but NASA can't. <laughs> and for those folks who are, are watching the video of this, be sure to note the suit that Felix is wearing. It appears to be about as cutting edge as it could possibly be. And I'm sure Don could explain a variety of ways it is. We're gonna reference that again when, when we touch on something else in a few minutes. Before we do that though, another project that you were lucky enough to get involved with, some people have seen either information about this or they might've watched the live broadcast in and of itself. How did you get involved with this project, Don? Well, First of all, as you can see, there's a picture of a balloon, some balloons in there. So um, basically, um, when, when you work on high level projects like that Red Bull Stratus thing, your, your name gets out there. So if somebody says, I want to do something crazy with balloons, somebody says, well, you should probably call Don and ask him if he thinks it's a good idea or is, is this something that you can help with the weather? And that's where that started from. You know, this project right here would have never happened with really probably without Red Bull Stratos because, you know, at, 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 when Red Bull Stratos uh, 
one thing that I, I remind folks is, is that Red Bull broadcast that thing over the whole world on YouTube, but it was broadcast at prime time on a Sunday evening in all of Europe. You know, there were 50 million people watching it live on television. Um, so it reached a lot of people. Um, it reached so many people that the beverage sales of Red Bull energy drink increased 2%. Now, people say, well, that's only 2%, but global 2% increase in sales was $4 billion of Red Bull. So a lot of people saw that and a lot of people were inspired. And I will tell you that the phone rang a lot for several years after Red Bull, mostly with people with crazy ideas that never had a chance of success. However, this is one of the phone calls where it's like, okay, you know, maybe we can make this work. And this is something that was put together in the last year and a half very quickly. And the person who is named as a part of this and also is represented in the photo above the cloud layer, uh, his name is David Blaine. For those folks who haven't heard about him, he gets described a var variety of different ways, but he's evolved in some ways from someone who can do amazing card tricks and sleight of hand to someone who does superhuman feats like this one. What was the idea that David had? Well, the idea was uh, that he, when he was a kid, there's a movie, famous French movie, I think it's just called The Red Balloon, of, of a boy grabbing a balloon and flying away. He saw that when he was really young. And ever since he saw that, he goes, I would just love to do that. Um, and he always had that in his mind because he does, as you said, he does stunts. He's an illusionist. He, you know, he put himself in ice water, underwater. He's been electrified, up, caught bullets with his teeth. You know, he's done all these things. But this was one thing that he had always really wanted to do. And then for those of you who, who uh, have kids at home, you know, you probably saw the movie Up, where they attached the balloons to the house, those colorful balloons, and it flew away. You know, so that all kind of was all part of the discussion. And his idea at the beginning was, I want to grab a bunch of balloons, I want to fly away, I want to fly as high as I can, and then I want to skydive back down to the earth. So it was a very simple concept, very simple concept. But again, it looks simple, but you want it to look simple at the end and make it look like you know what you're doing, but it was highly complex in terms of what we had to do. And again, this is another situation where they said, oh, by the way, this is going to be broadcast live on television with only a 10 second delay. Don't screw up. <laughs> there's, there's projects to where you're televised. And there's other projects to where you can do things and not have to worry about cameras and that type of thing. So that always adds a new element. And here are some shots from the project itself. The one on the left is taken from a helicopter. And then the one on the right is not taken from a helicopter. Don's not hanging outside a helicopter in the, in the photo <laughs> no. on the right. In terms of this particular project, two questions come to mind. One is, uh, what's something that you, when you look back on the project, you were really excited to be involved in? Was there any aspect of it that you really enjoyed? Well, yeah. You always want to be the first of anything, you know, the, the first time somebody has tried something. And that's what really makes it fun from a scientific and an engineering standpoint is solve problems for something that no one's done before, uh, you know? And so that involves a lot of testing, a lot of research and that type of thing. But also a really important facet of this was something that um, I hadn't been able to do before. It was part of my responsibilities is to bring the balloon and the payload back to earth safely and be able to recover. In this particular situation, um, it was a bit different because Red Bull and other projects I've worked on, you, you, you cause the balloon to rupture and then the payload comes under a parachute. And then you predict how the parachute's gonna go through the winds and land. And that's gravity. That's a parachute, gravity, it's gonna come down no matter what, you just gotta predict where it's gonna come down. In this particular situation, I had to fly the balloon remotely. So it was one of those situations that we had to be able to control a cluster of balloons remotely and bring it down safely. Uh, so we didn't hit power lines. We were able to recover everything, not cause garbage to be strewn all over the desert, that type of thing. So that to me was one new element that I hadn't been able to or had been asked to do before. And then with my ballooning experience, the, the, the idea that I would 
do the weather and also the flying was was something that was fun and stressful. <laughs> And stressful. And you don't look like you have many gray hairs either in this photo or in the, the live broadcast. You know, you can do a lot with Zoom. So, <laughs> <laughs> New video effects. There you the go. other question I had for you about this project goes back to our first conversation when we were talking about the project. And the question I had asked you, and I was a little nervous when I asked you was, um, how was it to talk with and to work with David Blaine, who's a worldwide celebrity, and I was really happy with your answer because you said he was incredibly gracious. No pun intended. He was very down to earth. He, <laughs> he was a very normal person. Um, I, I was really happy to hear you had that experience with him. Uh, is there anything else you would share about the experience overall? Well, yeah. I mean, one frustrating aspect of, of, of this is when I do get on projects like this, uh, for anybody that, you know, does a lot of things. You sign non-disclosure agreements. You sign NDAs to where you can't say anything or really other than your immediate family, you know, know what you're working on. And so this was something really exciting that I always wanted to tell people about, oh, we're working on this project, you know, and it's going to be great. Can't do that. Um, but at the same time, um, that is not a bad thing because that does take a little bit of pressure off when you're working behind the scenes. You're, you're, there's no expectations you're building up. So from one standpoint, that's, that's good. But it was a delight to work with David. Um, you know, when he called and he said his name, I thought I'd recognize the name, but you know, thank goodness for search engines. I'm talking to him on the phone and I do a search engine and they go, oh, okay, I know who this gentleman is now. But I will tell you that for something like this, the person or the star of the show, so to speak, is so dependent on his team his, his communications team, his balloon team, his engineering team, his medical team, that that person better be good at interfacing with them for his safety and to make sure everything works out good. Um, and that was certainly the case. And he recognized that if this is going to be successful, he needs to make himself available. And he worked so hard on this. You know, he, he had some pilot instruction for fixed wing aircraft earlier in his, in, his, in his life, but he had to get a balloon license. Not only did he have to get a balloon license, but he had to get a commercial balloon license. And he also had to get his gas balloon license because these were filled with helium, were flying with gas, which is different than hot air. Um, so he had to work as hard as everybody else. And, and when you see that, when you're working on it, that really helps, that motivates you. You know, everyone's motivated for success when you see that the person that you're, you know, the star of the show is working that hard as well. And he went out of his way, he really did, to make sure that he publicly uh, thanked everybody and worked everything. And you don't, you don't always get that, so it was refreshing. I will tell you, he is like a lot of successful people extremely hardworking, extremely motivated, and also extremely creative, and not ashamed to let his creative um, juices flow. Even if there was a creative idea that didn't make any sense or was not even feasible, um, being able to express those creative ideas led to other things. Um, and so it was, you know, it, it was quite inspirational to, to work with somebody that motivated and that creative. One of the other people that was on the team to do a callback, you mentioned earlier uh, in this recording, um, there's a person sitting next to you in this photo um, when you were working on the Red Bull Stratus project. Could you tell us who the Colonel is who's sitting next to you? Yeah, so this is a, a, a remarkable person. His name is Colonel Joe Kittinger. He's still with us right now. Colonel Joe Kittinger was the first person to dive from the stratosphere uh, under parachute. And the reason they did this was we brought up earlier spy planes. Well, the Air Force had to devise a way for pilots to be able to escape from a spy plane in the stratosphere and survive. The air is so thin up there that uh, number one, you have to be in a spacesuit. You have to be in a pressurized suit with oxygen. But since there's little or no friction, what ends up happening is you go into what's called a flat spin. And they had to figure out how a parachutist could dive from a high altitude, not go into a flat spin, which can kill you or, or make you pass out. And so while he was basically an Air Force grunt, he was an Air Force pilot, they said, 
uh, Joe, you're going to go up and you're going to jump from the stratosphere. And he said, yes, sir. I mean, that, that was his orders. And so he did it in the military as his day job. And he did several flights. And then his most famous one was in the early 60s. He went up to over 100,000 feet and uh, successfully landed back on the ground. Now, this was big news in the early 60s. It was on the cover of Life magazine. He ended up being uh, you know, kind of a, a celebrity for a couple of years. He was on the, the, the big game shows at the time, like who, um, trying to remember the name of it, but he got quite famous in the early 60s for doing this stunt. And it was really important because it's a little bit of history people don't know about. The spacesuit he wore became the basic sa same suit that started the Mercury program. And there it is. Um, this was a picture he took. He hit a button when he left. And this is over White Sands, New Mexico. And I always tell people, I say, look, He's got tape on there. That, you know, that was, that's high altitude duct tape, basically, is what he's going with. But here's a guy in an open gondola. Keep in mind, it's an open gondola. There's no pressurized capsule. So you know, you're going through 70, 80 degree below zero temperatures. You have to be in a pressurized environment. And he dove from that altitude and survived. And a little side story is he had a leak in his pressure suit near his glove. And he knew he had a leak when he reached his high altitude of 100,000 feet. And uh, that was an abort. He was supposed to abort if he had a leak, but he went anyway. And when he landed, his hand swelled three times its normal size due to the low pressure. Uh, when they found him and when he landed, his hand looked like a catcher's mitt. Um, so I, you know, the, the movie, The Right Stuff, highlighted the and the book, The Right Stuff, which I recommend anybody that likes stuff like that is, this was a gentleman that was left out of the right stuff because he has the right stuff. And he went on after this to be a fighter pilot in Vietnam, was shot down and was a POW in the Hanoi Hilton. Um, and then after he, uh, the war was over, he was the first person to fly solo across the Atlantic in a balloon. So this was a guy who was on the Red Bull Project because the record that Felix Baumgartner was going to break was his. So it's not often you get to be on a project where someone's trying to break your record and you're trying to help them break your record. But that was, uh, that was really neat to see the, uh, the removal of one's ego to fulfill someone else's dream. And that's exactly what Joe did in, in Red Bull Stratus. And for anyone who's even mildly fascinated with this, there are so many layers to this story. Uh, over a cup of coffee, I, I think Don shared about 17 or 18 layers to it, and I was fascinated by every one of them in the Colonel's story. Um, so we'll include a link to a couple of sites that you could go to and learn more about it when we post this. The other thing uh, that I'd be remiss if I didn't mention is uh, all the different things that you do for us here in Wyoming in terms of keeping us up to date on our ever-changing weather. Um, but also the way to contact you if you have a project that someone wants maybe to have you involved in or they want your advice on something. One of the ways that folks can get in touch with you is, is through Facebook, which is what they see here. Um, but you're also present in a lot of other ways, Don. If folks wanted to get in touch with you, how can they do it? Yeah, good. You know, if you just go to dayweather.com uh, or you mentioned Facebook, there's a good way to reach out to me. Uh, I No problem sharing my email address, which is really easy. Just D-O-N, Don at dayweather.com. More happy to answer questions. You know, I get a lot of questions about um, the weather uh, and what's going on with things. Um, and from our website, you'll see a link. We do a daily podcast Monday through Fridays on Wyoming and Colorado's weather uh, that you might find interesting out there. But more than happy to reach out to folks. Um, I mean, this, I'm very fortunate. What I do for a living is what I love. Um, so when I go to work every day, yeah, it's work, but um, I, the weather's my passion. And so uh, I, I love to share it with people as much as possible. Well, Don, I'm thrilled that you choose to keep doing it here in Wyoming. You know, the people you've interfaced with and the folks that you've been on teams with, you've seen a lot of different parts of the world. We're really glad you choose to stay here in Wyoming. And thanks for doing this today. I wouldn't be anywhere else. Thanks for having me. Thank you.